If you would, please turn with me in your Bible to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, as we continue in our verse-by-verse study of this wonderful epistle, <clears throat> and we are at a pivotal place in our study already this morning. As a matter of fact, one pastor has called the section we're looking at the two most important sentences ever written uh, to men. Now, I believe this is true, and I also believe these two verses are a key part of understanding the entire book of Romans. These verses will set the pattern and foundation for the rest of our time in this wonderful study. Now, before we get started this morning, I do want us to consider, if you've read ahead, you know the verses we're in, verses 16 and 17. And our title this morning is that we are not ashamed by faith. And as we get started, I want to consider a moment for you to, to question and, and examine, have you ever been ashamed of the gospel? Have you ever been tempted to be ashamed of the gospel? Or to put it in more robust terms, of your faith? Have you ever wished, for example, that it was, that it was more fluid, more adaptable to the circumstances and situation? Maybe more adaptable to humanity around you? Less confronting, less confrontational, less, less rigid that there were multiple aspects of it that we could just adapt to the, to the audience before us and, and make it more palatable. Now, before hearing those things and you hurriedly decide, no, I don't struggle with any of that, consider the words of the good doctor, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, and this is what he has to say in regards to this being ashamed. He says, if you have never been ashamed to openly proclaim the gospel, it is not because you are so courageous. It is because you probably don't understand the gospel. And I hope that sinks in this morning as we walk through Paul's proclamation of being unashamed of the gospel. As we consider in our own lives, what is the gospel? What is the, the power of God and the salvation? What does that mean? Why would we be ashamed? Why are we not ashamed? And when you think through that, what I want us to consider in our time this morning is, how can we fight being ashamed? If, as the good doctor says, all of us will in fact face it. It's not something new. Paul had to write to Timothy calling him to be unashamed as a workman, calling him to not be ashamed of the gospel, nor of Paul and his imprisonment for the gospel. If Timothy needed to be reminded and encouraged to not be ashamed, then so too do we. We live in a time where the truth that we believe and the truth which governs our lives, uh, that we live by according to our faith, this truth is hated more than ever before in our nation and in our world. It's not hated more than it's ever been, but it's hated more than we've ever experienced. And so there are many opportunities in this for us to be ashamed of our faith. Here we live in a time when the idea that any man or woman who has a brain would live their life according to a book which is considered archaic, the idea that we would trust what the Bible teaches us over and above modern advancements in humanity. That we would let it speak more loudly in our lives than our emotions and our fleshly desires. There are many voices today saying that we should be ashamed for our faith. For what it stands for. For where it leads us as individuals. Now what's interesting is Scripture, we're told that those voices that are in opposition calling us to be ashamed, those voices are the very ones who most need us to be unashamed with the gospel which we have believed and received. And so we need this morning's message so greatly in order that we might fight the shame that our world and our flesh wants to, desires to bring against the gospel and our faith in it. Read with me. We're going to read in Romans chapter 1. We'll start in verse 14 just to give a little context. But will you focus specifically in verse 16 and a little bit into 17. Romans chapter 1 beginning in verse 14. Paul says, I am under obligation <clears throat> both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you 
also who are in Rome, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Now, we've already looked in our introduction to this epistle, who Paul wrote this to, but just a quick reminder, he wrote this to the Christian brothers and sisters who were in Rome. Now, to be clear, Rome was not a hospitable place for the gospel. Rome was not a place that received well the influence of the gospel that made Christ or recognized Christ as Lord, as King of Kings, even over Caesar. More than that, it was a place of great immorality, great corruption. And so there was a great temptation to be ashamed of the gospel. The people in Rome would have faced it continually. And Paul wrote these verses to those who were there for their encouragement. And through the power and the authorship of the Spirit, ours as well today. When we face similar reasons to be ashamed, temptations to be ashamed. We need this encouragement because the truth is, if we consider the gospel as it truly is, we all are tempted to be ashamed of it. And so I've broken it down into two main points, two main points, and and, and I want to look at them together. Our first point this morning is very simple. It's reasons or temptations to be ashamed. What is it about the gospel that that makes it a temptation to be ashamed of? What is it about the gospel that Paul had to declare he's unashamed of it? More than that, he's eager to come to Rome and preach it. The second point that we'll look at is reasons to not be ashamed. And under each of these, there are multiple, many sub-points. Our first this morning, reasons to be ashamed, well, it's unacademic. We live in a time when academia has has reached a fever pitch of of growing in knowledge and and, and wisdom and other things and advancements in science and technology and you've got to keep up and everything is obsolete within a few months after it first came out. And the gospel is, as we just sang, it's that old story. It's the old ways where, where an unchanging God before the foundation of the earth even has put these things in place for us. Now we're going to be in multiple places this morning, so I encourage you to follow along on the screen, make notes of where we're going. You can go back and look at them later, but considering the unacademic nature of it, Paul had this to say to the church in Corinth in chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, verses 18 and 19. And speaking of the gospel, he says this, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And there's that stark difference when Paul says it is the power of God. It's the power of God to those who receive it, but to those who reject it, it's foolishness. For it is written, verse 19, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. In other words, believing the words of God over and above all the wisdom of our day, the cleverness around us, will make what we believe the gospel truth, our faith, it will make us be mocked and even hated. I've been called dumb, backwards. I had someone say to me one time that it was arrogant to believe that there could actually be a book that had that much truth in it that we could live our lives by it. And here's the scary part. In each of those instances that I'm referencing, it was by fellow professing believers that I was called that. And it's not that we're unprepared for it. Jesus himself set the example and prepared us well. When he he spoke in terms of how the world would view us, but called us to take heart because he has overcome the world. The Apostle Peter, who was known for his boldness, had this to say in 2 Peter chapter 3 by way of reminder to all those who are recipients. He said this in verses 3 and 4. Know this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking. Now, I want to just pause for a moment and, and make sure that we're hearing this fully and rightly. Mockers. Mockers. 
I don't know if you've ever been mocked. It's an unpleasant experience. I don't know if we take for serious to the degree of seriousness that Peter's describing when he says there will be those who will mock. They won't make passive aggressive statements in regards to your faith. That is a part of it, certainly. But Peter says that there will be those who are mockers that are openly mocking with derision and, and disgust, despising you because of your belief. You, because of what you believe, will be mocked. And it will come from those who Peter says in verse 3 are following after their own lust. And he says this is what it will look like, verse 4, in saying, where is the promise of his coming? In other words, you're living, he says earlier in 1 Peter chapter 3, you're living a life that doesn't make sense to the unbelievers of this world with whom you used to in your unbelief participate with them in those things. And so it confronts them, this new life that you're living, and they're going to mock it saying, wait a second, you're living for a fantasy. You're living in light of promises that are never going to be fulfilled. Look, he's promised it all this time ever since the fathers fell asleep. Nothing's changed. Everything just continues as it was from the beginning of creation. People are born, people live, people die, bad stuff happens, some live longer, some live shorter. There's no answer to this. That's what Solomon in his book of Ecclesiastes in our study there was confronting. This life is a vapor. It is hebel. Hebel, hebel, all is hebel. It's not an unknown truth from Scripture. But those who look to this world as the fullness of their desires, the fullness of all that they know and want, look to those who see something beyond this world and mock it. Because they're following after their own lusts. And in order to do so, they have to say, your belief is not true. It's unacademic. It's not only unacademic. It doesn't only not keep up with the latest in evolutionary theory and science and all the other things. It's not only unacademic, it is also, according to the wisdom of man, considered plainly foolish. I don't know if you know that about the gospel. And this goes back to what Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said. That if you have never felt an ashamed or a temptation to be ashamed of the declaration or the open proclamation of the gospel... It's likely because you have not really understood the gospel. It is folly and foolishness. Those are not my words, but we'll talk about why they are accurate. But in 1 Corinthians again, chapter 1, Paul has this to say in regards to the gospel. Verse 20, for where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. Well, what does Paul mean by that? Well, consider who he's speaking of. Christ crucified in Jerusalem on behalf or because of the Jewish people. This is what Peter preached at Pentecost to those who were gathered. This, this Jesus whom you crucified, confronting them. It's an offense, especially, most specifically, to the Jewish men and women of this generation. That's why Paul hated it when, when Stephen spoke to the leaders that were opposing them of the Jewish people. And they rushed at Stephen with hatred, gnashing their teeth, covering their ears, and crying out as they stoned him to death. Paul gave hearty approval to these things. He himself continued forward muttering threats and carrying out destruction towards the church. It was not something that in the flesh of those who were Jewish, it was an easy message to receive. It was a stumbling block for them that had to be overcome. And then think in terms of, of the Greeks, the, the Gentile believers who, who worshipped their own gods. Gods like Zeus and Apollos. Gods who flung lightning and dominated above all other things. And the message of the gospel says this Nazarene carpenter from the Israelite people, who by the way, the Israelite people had been conquered by the Gentiles in Rome specifically. Specifically. 
This Israelite, he was not only from a conquered people, but more than that, he was rejected by his own conquered people. And more than that, even, he died the death of a criminal. A shameful death, a death on a cross, which was the most heinous measurement that could be doled out to any man. What folly to man's heart to ever think of surrendering and worshiping such a one as this with your life. It's foolishness. You can't make sense of that. That's why God says, it's, where are the clever ones? I've destroyed their cleverness. It's not through your cleverness that men will be saved. It's not through the wisdom of the world that men will be saved. It is through the preaching of the message. The foolishness of the message which my power imbibes. Whereby men will be saved. You see, when you're sharing the gospel with an unbeliever... You are running the great risk of them seeing you as a fool. Doubly so. It doesn't make sense to our minds. It doesn't make sense to our finite judgments. I cannot conjure up in my own wisdom, my own intellect, my own academic understanding, my own fleshly desires a reason... To believe the gospel that I can touch, tangibly feel, that I can look to and say, well, it's going to produce this today in this way that's going to benefit my flesh. It's going to benefit my earthly desires. It's oftentimes sadly presented that way. And it's a false gospel. To proclaim the true gospel, we will be tempted to shame. By our own inabilities, our own doubts, and our own intellectual limitations. So many times people say to me, I want to share the gospel, but I just, I just don't know enough. If you've been saved by the gospel, you have every part of the message that's necessary to share with someone else. It is that simple. But we will be tempted to shame. On top of that, if you preach it unashamedly, then get ready to be unpopular. Because the third temptation is that the gospel polarizes. Take a minute and turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. This idea that there's a measure where, where everybody should just get along. Yes, we should live at peace. We're not talking about not being at peace or looking down upon others. That's not what's described here. But to have the idea that proclaiming the gospel somehow will not bring a response is anathema on the pages of Scripture. It's nowhere to be found. Listen to what Paul describes of his ministry with this gospel in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Beginning in verse 14, he says, But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. And so he's talking about the knowledge of Christ, the, the, the knowledge of God, the, the gospel, this gospel ministry. And he says, Thanks be to God that everywhere we go, he himself is making known through us the sweet aroma of the gospel in every place. But look at verse 15 and 16. What does this aroma do? For we are the fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, an aroma from death unto death. To the other, an aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? In other words, what Paul's saying is that when the gospel is proclaimed, praise be unto God, it is a sweet aroma of Christ, of the goodness, of the good news of God. But that, in this world, is going to be received in two ways, in two ways only. It will be received as that which gives life, and to the others who reject it, it will bear the stench of death. There's no in-between. The gospel polarizes. If, if you have some measure of thinking that, the gospel is going to make everyone just get along. No. We will all just get along when our ruling, reigning king returns from heaven with a sword and a rod of iron and rules upon this earth, restoring justice to that which is broken. Yeah. 
and doing so by his own sovereign strength alone. Until that time, the gospel is simply the means by which those who are perishing can be brought to life, eternal life. The gospel does not allow us to all just get along. It does the opposite of that. It polarizes. It brings with it those who are rejecting it the stench of death. But to those who are receiving it, it is the aroma of life. Make no mistake, the gospel is polarizing. And we recognize that. Because if you've proclaimed the gospel with an understanding and a recognition of the salvation, if you've proclaimed it in such a way that it is an aroma of either death or life to the one who is receiving it from you, you know that it will bring a response. And that response is oftentimes a response of rejection. Yes, there is temptation to be ashamed of this gospel that leaves no middle ground. That says there is only one way for man to be saved. There is only one name by which men can be saved. It leaves no middle ground. We cannot all just get along with the gospel between us. It does the opposite of that. Jesus said that. I came to divide homes. I brought a sword. And I will do that work. Why is it this way? Well, because the gospel is offensive. It's a stumbling block and foolishness. It's offensive. It confronts us at the very core of all that we've come to hope about ourselves and tells us we are wrong. Mostly is it offensive because it reveals to us that we can't fix ourselves on our own. We so desperately want to believe that. If we can just do away with hunger, the world will be better. If we can just do away with war, the world will be better. If we can just do away with poverty, the world will be better. If we can just educate the world, the world will be better. If we can just, you keep filling in the blanks. And history repeatedly and continually, even very present, ongoing, today history reveals these are not true. And yet, we still keep chasing the hope of our own humanity as though somehow there's something within us that can fix what's broken. And it can't. And so the gospel which declares that is offensive. So with that, here are some subpoints. Here are seven reasons in no particular order why the gospel is offensive to our natural state, to the natural man, to our natural flesh. Number one, the gospel declares that by nature we are not good, but rather evil, wicked, sinful, sinners. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, just looking at one place, it says, Therefore, just as through one man being Adam, sin entered into the world, and through sin, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. You see, we're not inherently good as much as we would like to think so. Rather, the opposite. We need to understand rightly that according to Scripture, we are not sinners because we have sinned, but rather we sin because we're sinners. If this is the nature of how God declares this truth about us, and we want to believe something different. We want to believe that somehow, in some way, there's something inherently good about us. Even, even to the degree that this is good enough about us that it caused God to choose us for salvation, seeing that which was good about us. But Scripture says that's not the case. That all have sinned. All have fallen short. All have chosen something other. All have followed the God of this world. Ephesians 2. And been at enmity with the God who gave us the gospel because of this. We are not inherently good no matter what the world wants us to believe. Rather the opposite. And the gospel is offensive because it confronts us with that. This truth about our condition leads to the second reason for offense to the gospel and temptation on our parts to be ashamed of the gospel. The gospel declares to all men everywhere that all of us are under condemnation. Romans 5, 
Verse 18. So then, as through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men. The gospel is necessary because all are condemned, because all are sinners. Now this provokes our own ideas of fairness. It invokes us to judge God according to our standards. And in so doing, can we not see the irony? When we read that there are none who are good, none who are worthy, none who seek after, and it provokes us in, in these ideas of, of, well, but God, it wouldn't be fair for God to hold that standard to all, thereby further confirming all that has already been stated about us. That we are at odds with God. That we have made ourselves to be Him and we are not. It provokes us in this area and thereby proves everything that's been stated. And even as it proves it, the offense doesn't lessen. It increases. It increases when, when you know you're wrong, but you desperately want to be right. And yet, you're going to doggedly pursue your own rightness. You don't have many options with those who stand in opposition to you being right. You can't just go along to get along and agree to disagree. If you are an unbeliever who's been confronted with the totality of the gospel and recognized, in fact, that you are before a holy God without hope in and of yourself, deserving his judgment and condemnation, and you choose to reject the life-giving gospel that he brought to this earth in his only begotten son, you can't just agree to disagree with the person who shared that with you. It's too confronting. You can't just agree to disagree, to go along, to get along, when you know that that person, with their whole heart and being, believes, believes this truth about them and you, and you reject it for your own wisdom, there's too much distinction between that. This third one is especially important in our generation. In our generation, I don't know if it's always been this way. It seems like it's gotten worse in my lifetime. But in our culture, we are permeated with a victim mentality. We want to blame someone else for, for everything in our condition. It's not my fault. I didn't want to be this way. So-and-so made me be this way. It's not my fault. They really know how to push my buttons. No, God speaks to anger. God speaks to anxiety. God speaks to all these things specifically and individually. And we cannot stand in a victim mentality saying, well, well God, I'm thankful for your gospel, but I didn't need it because it wasn't my fault that I was a sinner. It's very important that we understand one of the things the gospel declares about us is that it's not the things outside which condemn us, but the things inside. Look with me at Matthew 15. Jesus himself, through the gospel accounts, said these truths regarding man's condition, regarding my condition, regarding your condition. Matthew chapter 15, beginning in verse 18. He was confronted by the religious leaders. And he said this, and then the, his disciples said, well, tell us what this means. And this was his response, beginning in verse 18. But the things that proceed out of the mouth, they come from the heart. And those defile the man. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, slanders. These are the things which defile the man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. In other words, understand this. According to the gospel, it is not those around you. It's not your parents' fault. It's not your spouse's fault. It's not your children's fault. It's not your boss's fault. It's not the nation in which you were born's fault. It is you who are a sinner before a creator God who is holy. The gospel makes no provision for the flesh. 
It calls us to do the same. We cannot stand before a holy God and think that we shall blame another for our sinful condition. We cannot. It is the things from within us that defile us. It is we who are sinful. It is not our environment. Does it play a part? Of course it does. Ecclesiastes spent a majority of its time teaching us about how broken this world is. God himself declares from Genesis 3 forward the brokenness of this world, the futility of this life, the, the vapor realities of all that we experience here. Of course, our environment promotes our sinfulness. That's kind of the point. But at the end of the day, whatever your environment, whether you were raised in the most plush lifestyle with the greatest education, never suffering any physical harm and lived to be a hundred years old, or whether you're in the most ridden, poverty-stricken area in this world, it changes not one thing about the need for the gospel. Whether you're Gentile or whether you're barbarian, whether you're Greek, whether you're foolish, whether you're wise, whether you're wealthy, whether you're poor, whether you're male, whether you're female, it changes not the need for the gospel. See, this is offensive. It's offensive to, to be confronted with my own wickedness when I desperately want to esteem myself higher than above the fray. I want to examine myself according to my standards of the world at large around me and say, well, I'm not this, but at least I'm not that. And judge myself good. And we cannot do that. The gospel makes no room for that when it's proclaimed to the fullest. And this, brothers and sisters, offends our own self-righteousness and confronts our own worth and standards. Number four, it's offensive because it declares that because of this, we're not, under, we're not only under condemnation, but we fully deserve it individually. Not as the human race because of Adam. Not in that way, but we individually. Philip Smith is wicked internally defiled because of what comes from Philip Smith's heart. Philip Smith is in need of the gospel because before a holy God, I cannot measure up. And more than that, I not only don't measure up to his standard, I so have rejected his standards according to my flesh, according to this world, that I deserve the condemnation that he has promised he will bring. Oh, it is offensive when it confronts our own hope that I'm a pretty, I'm a, I'm a good person. I try really hard. I want to be a good person. I want to believe that I turned out okay in spite of whatever I faced adversity-wise in this life. And the gospel says, no, you are wretched, naked, poor, and blind apart from Jesus Christ and faith in him. Number four, it declares that we deserve God's condemnation individually. Now, we have to look at two places to see this. And there's, there's multiple places we could have looked. But I, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 and following, Paul makes this declaration in regards to us standing before the Lord in judgment. He says this in 2 Corinthians 5, beginning in verse 9, Therefore we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. Him being God. Verse 10, he makes this clear, For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And Paul addressed this in Acts 17 when he said that through the resurrection, God had declared that, that there was one who had the right of judgment and that he would judge. And therefore, all men everywhere must repent. Here he's declaring that more fully. He says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And so we might be tempted in hearing that to think to ourselves, wait a second, that's good news. That's good news. I'm, I'm, I, just need to, I just need to make sure my good outweighs my bad. My bad. 
All right, I'm going to be recompensed for deeds done in the flesh, whether good or bad. So therefore, this is where the Catholic belief comes in that we have to earn, work towards, accomplish certain things so that we might therefore be saved. That when we get on the scale, our, our bad is less than our good. And, and, the, and the, it balances this way and, and we, get, we get to go in. And, and you might think that if you just looked at this verse, verse 10. But before we get excited and think that somehow this means that there's a scale where our good deeds and our bad deeds are weighed out, consider what James says in verses 10 and 11 of chapter 2. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. Ah, oh, wait a second. You see, it destroys this idea where we might think, oh, well, I've done some good deeds. I've actually done more good deeds than, than bad. And, 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 you know, I've never committed adultery. I've never committed murder. I haven't done those wicked, horrible things. Sure, I haven't, I haven't followed the Lord and honored the Lord. And I've, I've, I've allowed my thoughts to run rampant. And I don't really want to follow the Lord. I don't want to give myself to Him. I, I want to live my life for myself according to this world. But you know, I'm a pretty good person at heart. And so it's okay to do that. And then James says, no, if you keep the whole law perfectly but stumble in one point, you become guilty of all. Verse 11 for. He who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit a murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. You see, God's standard is such that we want to change it, but we cannot. And so he declares it to us. Here's my standard. You must be perfect as I am perfect. And we cannot be. In our flesh, we are all condemned. In our strength, we all deserve condemnation before a God who is holy. This is offensive to our flesh. Unless we think our measurements on God's holy scales will be other humans. That's the most common argument I get in regards to rejecting the gospel. I'm a good person. I try hard. It's not like I'm, you know, Hitler because that's the standard of goodness in our world that you don't be like the worst. And we tend to think that our measurement on God's holy scales will be other humans. And then we can point out in that moment to God how much worse they are than us. God, it cannot be fair that I would spend eternity in the same place as one who is a murderer when I've never murdered. But he makes clear his standard is such that if you transgress one jot or tittle of the law, you have transgressed his law. You are a lawbreaker. And before a God who is holy... This is unacceptable. For him to sweep your law breaking under the rug is to deny his holiness, to deny his perfect justice, and to make a mockery of crushing his only begotten son on behalf of sinners. Amen. Brothers and sisters, the rest of humanity will not be on the scale across from you and I. Jesus Christ will be on the scale across from you and I. He is the standard of God's standard. He is, he is the epitome of it. And we don't measure up. In my own strength, all of us combined, take all the good deeds that we can in our own strength in this room accomplish. And Jesus Christ will still bottom the scale out across from us. That's what is declared in the gospel. That's why we're tempted to be ashamed for those who hear such things and don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear this need of theirs. They don't want to hear it. And, and this is common. I talk to people all the time who don't want to go to the doctor because he might tell them what's wrong. I talk to people all the time who avoid funerals because they don't want to be confronted with their own mortality. Sure, they believe they're going to die someday, but they don't want to think about it. They don't want to be forced, confronted to deal with it. And if you think that which is universally recognized such as death is confrontational and offensive and to be avoided, how much more so that which is almost universally rejected, the gospel, the good news of God's provision. It is God's standards that has to be met. And so it is only right and makes sense 
that in love it was him who had to meet it. This is the gospel. It's offensive that I am so wicked that the only hope I have is that God had to crush his only begotten son on my behalf. That's what Paul's explaining about the need for the gospel. Number five, the gospel is offensive because it declares that God is righteously angry towards sinners. We don't like this part of the gospel. You say, well, why do you think that's offensive? Well, because it's been so overlooked in almost all gospel presentations in the modern age. This idea that, that God is righteously angry towards sinners. How can God be a God of love and bear righteous anger? Well, brothers and sisters, that's why the gospel is good news because there is bad news. If there's no bad news, then there really is no good news. Hey, you don't really need a savior, but just in case you decide you want one, there's one that's been provided for you. That's not a gospel. No one would receive that. That's falsehood upon falsehood upon falsehood that damns men and keeps them in the condemnation that they richly deserve. In a few weeks, we'll be in Romans 1.18, where Paul says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and the unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. God is righteously angry towards not just the sin, but sinners. He doesn't cast your sin into hell. He casts the sinner who committed the sin, never repented from the sin, and never received the blood of Christ to cover the sin. They get cast into hell. That's why Jesus says, don't fear the one who can kill the body. Fear the one who after the body is dead will render judgment that casts you into hell. And by the way, this is not new. It's not new. Read. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. Have you ever heard of the flood? Right. Where God seeing the wickedness of man utterly destroyed, saving one family with water. That he's promised, 2 Peter 3, he's going to do that again, but this time through fire. It's nothing new. He gives us examples continually and repeatedly. Yes, God's most often response of character towards his people is mercy. You'll, you'll see that patience and mercy continually on the pages of scripture. But repeatedly throughout the pages of scripture he reminds us, hey don't forget. Don't forget I'm being merciful but I am also just. Don't forget I'm being merciful but I will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. You don't, you don't think so? Here's the flood. Here's a reminder. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember Nadab and Abihu. Remember Uzzah. Remember when I wiped out my own people with the Babylonians as they came in and brought judgment. Remember who I am. Remember Ananias and Sapphira. Remember the promises that my own son spoke repeatedly regarding the eternal nature of hell and the suffering and punishment and darkness that exists there where the wrath of God is poured out unceasingly for eternity and what is known as the second death. Don't forget I am not making a mystery, God says, of who I am. I am declaring in black and white for all to know the truth of who I am. This is not new. Listen to David in the Psalms describe this aspect of God's character in Psalm chapter 5. Because I hear these things. You know, God, God doesn't hate the sinner. He just, he hates the sin, really. Then why does he say this in verses 4 to 6? Of Psalm chapter 5. For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. You destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. There can be no measure where we somehow separate out our sin from us the sinner. That's a trick that Satan's given us, has perpetrated upon us, that makes us look to the gospel and the offensive nature of it and turn away from it. God is righteously angry towards sinners. 
And this is the righteous judge before whom we shall all stand. But God in love crushed his son and poured his wrath out upon him so that all who would receive this gospel might themselves never be condemned, even though we deserve it. That he looked upon his son at the cross and he saw me. So that when he looks upon me, he sees his son. This is the gospel. This is the gospel. And for those who are receiving it, it is, it is the aroma of life unto life. But for those who reject it, it is the stench of their own death upon death. It's offensive to our natural man, to say the least. And it is very likely, it is promised, in fact, to cost us when declared in this way. You see, Paul needed to say that he was unashamed of this gospel because to be ashamed of the gospel is common to each of us. Number six. The gospel declares and is offensive to us because it declares we cannot save ourselves. As a matter of fact, it declares that our best works, the very best that humanity can come up with, are as filthy rags. The prophet Isaiah says this in chapter 64 and verse 6. For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. The best that we can come up with on our own, in our natural condition before a God who is holy this is a filthy filthy garment this is the beauty of the gospel this is the beauty of the gospel that, that when you look at passages like Colossians chapter 3 we put off the old that which is stained and filthy that which we've labored and, and, and striven to do we put it off and we put on the new that which Christ has redeemed, that which Christ's righteousness has made alive. We get rid of the stench of the death of our own sin and of this life and of our own effort. And by faith, brothers and sisters, we trust in the finished work of Christ. And we receive that finished work freely as a gift given to us. And we wear it proudly, unashamedly. But we have to be reminded that in this life, as we run this race, we do get bogged down. We do get entangled. And shame comes quickly upon us. We need to be reminded of this. Paul didn't use this language for no purpose. He didn't say he was unashamed because he'd never been tempted to be ashamed. He didn't say he was unashamed because no Christian ever is ashamed. He said it because we are. It's offensive to our flesh that we cannot save ourselves. And it is exceedingly offensive to our flesh that the very best we can actually offer is as a filthy rag before the one to whom we would offer it. You see, it's offensive because our flesh esteems itself very highly. And we live in a world that wants us to esteem it more highly. I hear constantly that some of the greatest struggles are our poor wonderful teenagers are facing is that their self-esteem is not where it ought to be. I hear things like they just, they just need to learn to forgive themselves. That's so unbiblical. It's so unbiblical. If I could forgive myself, I don't need the blood of Jesus Christ to accomplish that forgiveness. It's offensive in a world that wants to esteem itself highly to a flesh that wants to esteem itself highly, that wants to point to others as the reason that we've been victimized. It's not my fault that I have this struggle. Someone else caused this. You think I want to live in a depressive funk? Someone else did this to me. The gospel's insufficient to bring me out of this. This person is more powerful than Jesus Christ. Look at what they've caused me to become. Look at how they've caused me to act. The gospel leaves no room for those things. We don't get to call sin diseases. 
We don't get to call them diagnoses of things that aren't our fault. We have to look at it and say, no, God made me perfectly, fearfully, and wonderfully in my mother's womb. And I was born into a broken world, and I've suffered under the brokenness of this world. Sin has splashed upon me. It has been visited upon me. I am not responsible for those things in the sense that I will not stand before God and give an account for the sins of others that was brought against me, but I will stand before God and give an account for the sin that I myself chose. And we all do. And we all shall. And so it is this inability that the gospel declares and leaves no room for that is very offensive. Because of our inability, it forces us to put our hope in something outside of us. Because of our inability, you see, if we have some ability, then why do we need Jesus? If we have some goodness, why do we need his goodness? If our self-righteousness is sufficient, why do we need his righteousness imputed to us? And number seven, the gospel is offensive because it requires faith in Jesus proven by obedience. John chapter three, it contains that beloved beautiful encapsulation of the verse and verse of the gospel in verse 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believeth in him might not perish but have eternal life it's it's probably the most if not the most well known verse on the pages of scripture it is a beautiful beautiful verse in regards to the gospel but it is not a standalone it comes with the context that surrounds it listen to verse 36 just a few verses shortly behind that in John chapter 3 he who believes in the Son has eternal life. It builds off of verse 16. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. That verse should be as well known as verse 16. That we need to recognize and, and be confronted. You do have to believe and trust in Jesus absolutely. This trust, though, is, is testified to. It is proven. It is displayed in our obedience. Just as disobedience is actually a display of unbelief. Hebrews chapter 3 says very clearly that in their disobedience, the Israelite people under Moses were not able to enter into their rest. And this was because of unbelief. It connects the two so clearly as does John chapter 3 verse 36. As does John chapter 15 and verse 8. Where it says, by this you will prove to be my disciples that you bear much fruit. You do have to believe and trust in Jesus, but, but this trust will be displayed in our obedience, just as disobedience displays unbelief. If I say something about confidence in, trusting in, if, if I say, just to pick something random, if I say that, that someone's roofing company, I believe is the best roofing company, they do the best job, they are quality, have integrity, I have great faith in this roofing company. Then I hire another roofing company. Someone's lying. Right? And, and the roofing company that I've so spoken of with such accolades and such promise of faith and trust and recognition and belief and those things, it would be right for them to say, I don't think you meant that. Well, in the same way, how much more so the God of the universe who created us and gave his only son that we might be redeemed through the crushing, the shedding of his blood, the pouring out of wrath that he himself drank down on our behalf. That we would profess faith in him, but then continually not follow him. Or Maybe not continually, but every time that our desire was at odds with the commands of Scripture, we followed us instead. That's not faith. That's not belief. It's the opposite. You have not believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have not believed that he is in fact God himself. That he humbled himself and came to this earth and laid aside his glory. That he humbled himself to become like a man, to take on flesh that he might die, that he proved these things to be true when he by his own power and strength defeated death from inside of death and walked out of the tomb. Can you really look to that belief and say, yeah, but with my business, what does he know? With my dating life, what does he know? With my marriage, oh, what does he know? 
I mean, yes, yes, he, he is my creator. He does hold my eternity. He does love me so much that in my sin, he sent his son. But when it comes to the way I speak, what does he care? I don't care what it says in Ephesians 5. It doesn't apply to me. Me and Jesus are good. I've believed in him at the cross. I'm just not going to do what he says. Ha, ha, ha. That's not faith. It's the opposite of faith. And you still stand condemned if your gospel belief has not led you to trusting and following Christ. Taking up your cross day by day and pursuing after him. Failing, sure. Stumbling, yes. Repenting, yes. But following, yes. Fighting sin, yes. Putting to death the earthly things that are within you, yes. Looking to Christ day by day for all that you need. That you might run the race before you. Declaring yourself to no longer be a citizen of this world, but that your citizenship is now in heaven where there awaits you an inheritance that cannot be touched, having been sealed by the Spirit, that you are laying up for yourself treasures there and not here. That is faith. And if that is not the condition of your heart, the condition of your life, the condition that you're fighting and striving against your flesh, we have to fight against the temptation to be ashamed of the gospel because our flesh does not like the results the gospel brings. In the same way as we fight against our sin, we fail. I'm not talking about perfection being an example of faith. If that was the case, then we would just go to heaven. But we don't. We're here with a purpose, with a mission. We would take this good news by which we have trusted and hoped in. And then we would share it with those around us. The gospel confronts us with our own sinfulness, our own weakness, our own guilt, and our own desperation. Of course it is offensive. And of course it will cost us. There are reasons in our culture and there are reasons in our flesh to be ashamed of the gospel. In regard to man's condition, I'm regularly confronted with angry men and women who themselves profess the gospel. Regarding the idea that telling their children that they are sinners... Making their children feel like God is in fact angry over their sin. That they in fact are at odds with a God who is holy. Makes them angry. They don't want that gospel in the lives of their children. In their own lives. Please understand the reasons for offense are many. And thus the temptation for us to be ashamed are many also. But to be clear, those reasons, even as they are real, they are incomparable for the reasons to not be ashamed. It's our second point this morning, reasons to not be ashamed. Number one, the gospel is good news. It's not bad news. The bad news is already there. Whether, whether someone hears it or not doesn't change it. The bad news of man's condition before a God who is holy already is established and exists whether they ever hear of it or not. It's true nonetheless. We get to share with them the good news. That in spite of that, this, this good news, it brings healing, not harm. It brings light, not darkness. It brings forgiveness, not judgment. It brings a light burden to what was before crushing futility. Brothers and sisters, we are all slaves. We're either slaves to sin or we're slaves to righteousness. We're either slaves to Satan or we're slaves to the Savior. That's who we are. Why, why do we call him master and not do what he says? Even as you were telling people this, the, the gospel is good news, God's good news for all that is offensive between him and us. And even as you are telling others the bad news about our condition, it's because you have good news for it. You don't just go tell people that you're a wicked, wretched sinner and there's no hope for you. You do that because you in fact have hope for them. It's good news. More than that, we are ashamed, unashamed of the gospel in its glorious entirety because it is the power of God. This is not saying simply that the gospel is a means of experiencing God's power. That's not at all what it's saying. More than that, it's declaring that it is the actual preaching of the gospel that is God's powerful means to save sinners. 
1 Corinthians 1 and verse 21, Paul says this, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. It's also a recognition that true salvation from the gospel is a supernatural work, not from man, but from God himself. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, it says this, He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. This is what Jesus told Nicodemus. Man must be born again. Nicodemus says, that doesn't make sense to me. I can't fathom that in my academic learning, in my intellectual ability. It doesn't make sense. Does a man have to enter into his mother's belly a second time? What are you saying? And Jesus says, no, this is by the power of the Spirit that this is accomplished and by him alone. When we are burdened to share the gospel, I think shame most often consumes us or, or overtakes us because we're consumed with thoughts about the person we're sharing with at the forefront. This hinders eagerness and it leaves a wide door for being ashamed. Brothers and sisters, focus rather on the God who has given the gospel in his power than on the one in front of you whom you're sharing it with. Because it is about, if it is about his power in saving a sinner, we will also be constrained to share it fully because we would never, in love for the person in front of us, want to rob the message of any of its power. 1 Corinthians 1.17 For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. People ask me all the time, can you, can you give me a show? Tell me how to share the gospel. Well, it's not in cleverness of speech. Hey, it's not in being able to pull the net in and close the deal like you're some salesman of something. Have you not learned from what we've even spoken of this morning, you can't sell this gospel? Man's flesh would never receive this by your own wisdom, cleverness, manipulation, or anything else, nor by their own recognition. It's impossible. Not in cleverness of speech, 1 Corinthians 1.17, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. In other words, if you convince someone by your own cleverness of the message that you're proclaiming, they are not saved. The power of the cross has been made void. And there is no power of God in that gospel message. We must never forget why we share this gospel. What is the purpose of this power? Why are we not ashamed? What is the purpose of this power and this good news given to men? Number three, to save. To save. It's not bad news. It's good news. They already are condemned. They already will stand before a God who is holy and give an account with him whom they have to do. We come with the good news that gives them peace. Romans 5 and verse 1. You will be at peace with God through the gospel. Remember the offense regarding man's inability to save themselves? The gospel is God's powerful answer to this problem on our behalf. This is why we are in a shame because the requirement is the same for all men. Faith in God and his word. It, it doesn't matter the height of stature nor the depth of sin that the person in front of you represents. Neither of those are a hindrance to the gospel. You can unashamedly present it to all men because all men need it. And no man is less needy nor better equipped to receive it than any other. And that brings us to our fourth and final point. We are not ashamed of the gospel because it is for all men. There is no distinction with God. There is no human being who is above needing the gospel. And there is no human being who is beyond receiving the gospel. We must take it into each of our individual circles. Each of you who have received this gospel and been saved by this gospel are also entrusted by God with this gospel inside of this jar of clay, which is our earthly tent. And we have been given this so that we might take it into the lives of those you are uniquely able to. Every one of you in this room have people in your life that I'll never meet. Every one of you in this room have people you interact with and have opportunity with and love and care for that the elders of this church will never meet. Each of you in this room have parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles, brothers and sisters, cousins, children, grandchildren, co-workers, friends and neighbors who you have been entrusted by God to unashamedly share his good news with.
We who have received it must now by faith in it walk according to it. This is where our faith comes in. We'll just touch on verse 17 and go more fully into it next week. But Paul says, for in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. The righteousness of God that is necessary for all of us is revealed in his good news of Jesus Christ. This is God's righteousness poured out. And his substitutionary death on our behalf. Now this is revealed from faith to faith. There's a, a lot. If you're not familiar with, when I say a lot, more than 25 that I've seen differing views regarding Paul's statement here. And he is somewhat ambiguous, which I don't think is an accident. What does it mean that, that it is from faith to faith? Well, very simply, the, the, the one that seems to fit the context, both grammatically with the antecedent that's here, and also in the most simple understanding of the fullness of the gospel, is that this righteousness of or from God in his gospel is received from each individual in each generation in the same way, by faith. And that each one who does shall then live by this faith. Brothers and sisters, there is much within our world and within our own flesh which finds this gospel offensive and even unbelievable. Which, by the way, that's why it must be received by faith. And this is a strong argument for its authenticity. Have you ever thought about that? What human being would ever come up with this gospel as a means of getting other human beings to agree with them and join them? Who would do that? Only a fool. Only a fool. Or a God who by his own power brings salvation to those who hear and receive it. There's no in between. No, this gospel is from God alone. And it bears his power within it. Have you yourself received this gospel by faith? Have you trusted in the good news of God for your salvation? In the finished work of Jesus Christ and his righteousness alone for your forgiveness? If you have not, it's available to you even this morning. In Hebrews 3, it says, as long as it is still called today, today is the day of salvation. It is available for you today to look to him, recognizing your own inability and trust in the finished work that he has provided freely to all who would come to him for it. And if you have done that, then let us be unashamed in sharing this gospel, brothers and sisters. Let us share it by faith and live our lives according to it day by day. Would you pray with me? Lord, you are God and we are not. And yet we want to. In our flesh, it is our desire. It is the original sin of Satan. And it is a plague upon our own flesh and humanity in this world that we would want to usurp you, to judge you, to declare ourselves righteous apart from you. But Lord, you are God and we are not. And we confess these truths this morning. I pray for all who are here who have never trusted in the finished and completed work of you at the cross, not recognize their own need, that have held back some measure of hope in something other than your blood and sacrifice. Lord, I pray that even this morning that they would throw themselves wholly upon you by faith. And Lord, for we who have done that, I pray that we would be renewed this morning to be bold in our declaration, our proclamation, that we would be unashamed workers, rightly dividing your word of truth and sharing it with those around us for edification and sanctification of the fellow believers you have placed in our life and for justification and adoption for the unbelievers that are in our pathways. Give us your wisdom and strength to the accomplishment of this. In Christ's name, amen.